G'day folks, Troy Dean here and welcome to another episode of the WP Elevation podcast, the show where we help you start and grow your very own WordPress consulting business. And I'm very pleased to have with me our feature guest this week, Kurt Phillip from Convertica. Hey Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, mate. Pleasure. Thanks for, for doing this. Now, for those that don't know, who is Kurt Phillip and what do you do? Kurt Phillip is uh, is founder of Convertica, and we're a we're a CRO done for you company. So we do conversion rate optimization, fully done for you for clients. So we don't just do split tests, we don't just do UI designs. We do the whole package from start to finish for people. Wow, um, this is probably one of my favourite topics of all time. I could like geek off about this stuff for days, mm -hmm. and I do regularly, um, uh, much to my wife's um, uh, boredom. Um, so how did you get in? Now, we were talking uh, off camera before. You are a butcher by trade. Mm -hmm. How the hell did you get into conversion rate optimization? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that was a while ago now. It was a good 12, 13 years ago. But um, I don't know. I always just had an avid sort of, like as, as most internet geeks do, just an avid interest for internet and web design and all that sort of stuff especially from a young age when the internet first came even before i was a butcher but i didn't go to university or anything like that so i just fell into that as a butcher to be honest and then my my nerd inside me eventually came back out again after i had a bit of bit of cash when i finished but um yeah just self-taught web design self-taught graphic design all that sort of stuff and then um in the later years sort of like i was an seo for most of my 20s run my own seo consultancy then started to, I moved out to Chiang Mai, which is known as a pretty big SEO internet market, digital nomad destination. That's where I met a lot of the community um, in the early days of 2012, something like that. Um, and then I partnered with a lot of sort of bigger names out there and then got into affiliate marketing and then sort of, yeah, found my specialization in, in, um, in CRO and then sort of took it from there, noticed the demand for it and it really, really grew very quickly once I once I set up, uh, originally it was called CRO Guy when I was doing it sort of as a freelance side gig. Mm. And then very quickly within sort of like a eight month period, I rebranded as Convertica and then it just it really blew up from there. Did you know when you were doing the affiliate marketing stuff and hanging out in Chiang Mai, mm -hmm. did you know that you were doing conversion rate optimization or were you just trying to get better conversions and then all of a sudden you, re you kind of went, uh -huh, I think I've got some skills here that I could package up. Yeah, I guess I always had a, an interest for it in general, even for my clients back in the day, but I didn't ever think it was a thing, right? I just, I never thought it could be a specialization itself. Well, it never could back then. There wasn't enough demand for it. Mm. Um, but the, I think the, the real light went off when I, I studied very, very, or not very brief, it was two years back in Australia. I went to a college that specialized in share trading and investment. Mm -hmm. And then having the background of, web design and SEO and then pairing that with investment, you know, and then I saw this whole trend of people buying investments, uh, affiliate sites and lead gen sites for their portfolios. I became good friends with Empire Flippers. I became mm -hmm. friends with some people from uh, FE International and got to know like that market. And then my mentor is an investor too. So then I paired the two worlds and started to go, okay, there's a lot of uh, demand here for investment firms that, you know, the CRO could be used on. They get a better return for their investors when they're buying these websites. And then it sort of spiraled, spiraled out of there. And I really, I partnered with a guy called Matt Diggity out in Chiang Mai in 2013, 2014. And we started a company called Leadspring where we partnered with people. We did SEO and CRO. And then we took a cut of the increase in revenue from that. Hmm. Um, and then, then I really noticed the demand for CRO from big, big sites, from big uh, affiliate sites. And then, yeah, and then sort of got my name out there and it went from there. Wow, I am familiar with Leadspring. And in fact, Matt Diggity is in my calendar, I think, for later this week or next week to be on the podcast. Yeah, so, cool. a small world. Sure. Um, so, for those, for the uninitiated, what the hell is conversion rate optimization? Essentially, essentially, it's just being able to create more revenue or more conversions. Um, so if it's an e-commerce site, it would be creating more sales. If it's a affiliate site, it would be sending more people to your affiliate partners and getting paid more commission. If it's a lead gen site, like a real estate site or something like that, it would be getting more leads and getting more phone numbers and, and emails and stuff like that. And it's just about uh, running a bunch of tests. We call them AB or split tests. 
um, and and come up with a bunch of hypotheses and um, ideas and different designs that could possibly outperform based off research and also past experience and then splitting these uh, the users to the website and showing them one version and then showing half of the group another version and seeing what performs better essentially and it's just a process of rinse and repeating that uh, multiple times over the, the length of the campaign. And there's a fair bit of work. I've done a bit of CRO work myself over the years. There's a fair bit of work mm -hmm. involved. There's a lot of detail. You kind of have to approach it as if you're a scientist. Uh, the average listener listening to this podcast is like, okay, well, this is great, but, uh, you know, I've got so many moving parts at the moment. I've got so many things to focus on. Um, why is this something that they should be paying attention to? It's... Well, there's a there's a bunch of different ways. It depends on the goal of of the of of their, their personal goal for their website. For instance, are they looking to sell the website in a year? Are they looking to grow their income to reinvest back into SEO or PPC, or are they looking to get their PPC cost down because they're making more conversions? So then, getting their their cost per lead or or cost per sale. Down. So it depends on the goals, but that's where it would become, for instance, if you're an SEO and you're looking to um, maximize revenue from the same traffic to get um, to get so, you know more, more cash to reinvest into the website or just make more money. But it depends on the, where you are along the process too. So if you're already maxed out all your rankings and you're number one for all your keywords, mm. that's usually the time when our, when our clients will come to us because they've maxed that out. They've got sort of like a 12 to 24 month time frame. They want to sell the site and they're looking to sort of milk 30 to 50% sort of um, increase in revenue out of that site before they sell it. That's generally the, the, the brunt of the clients we get. Um, I want to dig in. There's a lot to unpack there and I want to dig into a little bit of it in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about offsite stuff. How do you deal with a campaign where uh, this is something that we're actually going through right now at the moment. This is why I'm asking. How do you deal with mm -hmm. a campaign where you're running ads to a split test? How do you deal with um, ad sent for those that don't know, you know, the congruency between the ad that someone sees either on the display network or Facebook or search result pages, they click through, they get to a landing page that landing page could be running a different, a couple of different split test designs mm -hmm. to optimize conversion rate. How do you deal with that disconnect between the ad they see and the landing page that they eventually land on? Well, as long as as long as all advertising remains the same as it did before, then it it doesn't really matter. Let's just say you're testing an ad that converts well to a landing page. Well, you're not going to change more than one or two elements on that new split test. So you don't go and fully change the landing page up unless you want to fully change the look out of it. Maybe you're looking, you're getting like a cheap looking old school blog versus a new design and seeing which performs better, which has shown some very interesting. A lot of the time, the older mm. like blog looking styles have outperformed them. But as long as you don't change any variables and there's a control, then, then you're fine, which means you don't change a lot of things. You change one thing at a time on your split tests. And you keep the traffic. That's the most. That's the most important thing. Is keep the traffic exactly the same that you're sending to the site. Don't, because we have some clients that say, "Hey, we can speed the tests up. We'll send more traffic to the website." But you need to make sure that it's qualified traffic. It's already tested and converted well. You can't just send any traffic at the website. It has to um, remain the same. Which is why most most over fifty percent of our clients are SEO pure SEO websites because that is you know no, no variables are changing there. Of course. Unless they uh, unless they get a penalty from an update or something like that, which happens from time to time. But. Yeah, um, they, they, and there are lots of moving parts with this kind of stuff. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, one thing that's coming to mind is you've got an image on an ad. You send them to a landing page. Uh, mm -hmm. The the ad's converting well. The landing page we have a theory that could improve better. We actually want to change the design of the landing page, which means the image that we're now using on that ad is, there's kind of going to be a disconnect between what they see in the ad and what they see on the landing page because we're going to take that image off the landing page, for example. That's, Got it. that's actually an mm -hmm. example we're working through at the moment. Does that mean I need to change the image on the ad and keep everything else the same? Well, it depends on the hypothesis and what the landing page's goal is. So, mm. so yeah, as long as the traffic stays the same, then what your hypothesis was you removing the image right or changing the image yeah well that's your hypothesis and how you'll validate that hypothesis is by running the split test mm. 
So that's we don't we don't like to, of course, unless we have a long list of proven tests and hypothesis that we've run before. And in certain niches, we'll run similar tests because we know they work, but we'll always still run the test. And it's just a hypothesis until the data proves us otherwise, like mm. what the what the actual result is. And we always have to stay in that in that frame of mind is the data tells us the answer. We don't let our emotions and our ego yeah. make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Um, so, um, good answer. Not the one I wanted to hear, but good answer. Because uh, my, <laughs> my ego is usually the thing that gets in the way. Um, the the uh, it, it, what, what do you test first? Do you test the traffic or do you test that? Like if I've got traffic going to a landing page and the landing page is converting about 16%, I'm mm -hmm. like, ah, well, I think we yeah. can do better there. Do I, yeah. do I make sure my click-through rates are right and my cost, per, uh, my cost per impression or my cost per action is right first before I mess around with the landing page? Correct. Correct. Right. If it's paid traffic, correct. Yeah. And then once that has proved, because you, you need to get a baseline reading of the website, which is essentially like a health reading on the mm -hmm. website to see what the conversion rate is. Once you've got that ad, once you've got that traffic converting, then you can start to optimize areas of that, that landing page. Now, the issue a lot of people run into when they don't have a process that they use is they try to change three, four, mm -hmm. five things on, on a web page at the same time. And you don't, like one thing could increase conversions by 20%. One thing could make the conversions go down by 20%, and one thing could make it go up by 10. So you don't know what um, what is what is working. So it does take patience, um, but that's why having a, a built-out process is really important because you need to know. Well, first off, getting heat maps on your landing page is the most important thing to see where people are interacting with your page. And by interacting, I mean where are they clicking the most because mm -hmm. that'll be tracked as a goal. So that's where we start split testing first because that's where you're going to get the quickest results. If people aren't clicking on an area of the page or they're not clicking the area you're testing, you're never going to get a result. So that's why it's important to just do the high, the high flow areas and then, and then. But gen, like generally, we'll know that when we start a campaign because we've done you know sites in that niche before or or yeah. something like that. But generally, if you haven't done split testing before, the best way to do it is get heat maps on, see where the interaction is, which most of the time you'll already know because you've only got one call to action or two call to actions on your page. But yeah, but that's essentially. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the tools that you might use. But before we get into the mm -hmm. weeds, there, um, uh, how long should you? Uh, so I've been following. Uh, um, uh, Sean Ellis for a, a long time now, growth hacking. Of course, he was the one of the growth hackers. Well, he kind of, you know, mm -hmm. rumour has it, he coined the word growth hacking when he was at Coined Dropbox. Word, yeah. um, he's now got growthhacking.com and the North Star software is a fantastic thinker. And so we really follow his scientific approach about coming up with hypotheses, giving everything an ice score and then running experiments, you know, kind of one at a time. Um, how, mm -hmm. long, how long do you think you need to run an experiment for to get a kind of statistically significant result? Most of the time, the the split testing software, whether it's VWO, whether it's Optimizely, whether it's Google Optimize, and there's a bunch of others now. There's a ton of mm. new solutions coming to the market. We personally use VWO in-house, but it's only really makes sense on, on enterprise level when you're running a bunch of campaigns. Mm. Um, but essentially, it'll call statistical significance at 98%. Now, some rough numbers. Now, I, I haven't really seen anyone talk numbers. Some people say a thousand views is too low. Some people say 10,000 views is too low. But from what we've seen in our tests working with, we've probably, we've worked with somewhere between 300 and 350 sites in the last 24 months or like 18 months, sorry. Mm. So we've got a lot of data on this. Generally, we'll see if you're, if, if you're running a split test and your variation B or the page you're testing is outperforming the original by over 20%, then you'll need much, much less than one that's only winning the winning the split test by 5%. Yeah, okay. You might need, because the variation, the statistical significance is so close, it needs to make sure there's no anomalies in the numbers here. Whereas if it's a 50% increase, we've seen some tests called it 1,000 views right. on a 50% increase because there's no doubt that this one's outperforming the original got it but we don't actually like to call tests if they're anything under five five percent if it's under five percent we'll come back to the drawing board and come up with another hypothesis and restart the test huh. um 
so yeah generally you'll get but mo for mo for most things between 10 and 30 percent increase in conversions on your on your variant you'll generally get a test result between 2,000 and 10,000 views generally but there's a bunch of other variations that come into that like yeah. Are you tracking Amazon affiliate commissions? Are you tracking sales on a website? Is it just op like if it's an opt-in website where you're just trying to get email subscribes or you're just trying to get a phone number, it's going to be a lot lower because there's no other conversion things along the chain. It's just like that's the only thing you're tracking as a conversion. So there's but generally we will get a, a conversion result with between two and two and ten thousand. Got it. Views. I want to talk a little bit more about VWM in a sec because we've used it uh, and I want to ask a couple of questions about it and uh, maybe some other mm -hmm. alternatives. But before we get there, how do you manage your experiments? Like do you have like a uh, – do you use growthhacking.com or do you have like Trello or how, how, do you, how do you manage your experiments? So we used to – about a year and a half, two years ago when we really started to grow this out, we've got we've – got, I think we've just done our 20th hire today. So we've got 20 staff. Wow. We've got – 12 or 13 in the operations team. Hmm. Um, so we have very, we run a very corporate style structure with top down um, sort of structure. So there's a lot of different members assigned to different roles, but essentially, um, how do we manage tasks? I'm not going to break this down specifically. So we we'll, we manage most data through Slack. We've got, we've custom developed APIs, uh, custom developed scripts and plugins that work with the APIs from VWO and then other software we use that pull in reports and, you know, when things hit statistical significance, when things are looking bad, tests are underperforming and we need to get action on it and all that sort of stuff. Um, we have a daily uh, spreadsheet that gets pulled of all our campaigns running and then campaigns that are winning will light up green, campaigns that are under, like I said, under 5% will light up orange and then ones that are negative will be in the red so they can we can sort of get a bird's eye view because we are running say five or six hundred tests at a time we need to have that like macro view very easy to diagnose issues hmm. um, and then then we run tests pause tests pull reports on tests all from inside slack so we've created scripts that we can do commands and then it will auto generate all this stuff from from bwo got it um and then yeah, there's a bunch of other movement because we do all the te uh, test split, uh, test setups, we do all the UI design, we do all the integration with their website, which sometimes, you know, it never works perfectly, so it can take some time. Then we also run all the reporting and the integrations of a winning test, then the re-setup of tests. There's a lot of different moving parts there and a lot of different team members that are assigned to all that. So it, it didn't just happen. Like, I wouldn't be able to give someone a how to run a CRO company now no. wouldn't be able to like offload that because it was something that evolved over time and was like we hacked it together as we needed to innovate, you know, yeah, so yeah. it wouldn't be a, yeah, so it did did take a lot of time to get to where it is today. But essentially, yeah, it's just um, a lot of different team members. We use Slack very, very heavily. Yeah. Um, it's it's a great little like mainframe that you can plug everything into obviously yeah, yeah. to 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 make it play happy. And uh, what about your knowledge base? Like if a new team member comes on board and says, all right, uh, mm -hmm. guys, I've been given this opt-in page. I need to run a split test on it. How do I know which experiments have worked well in the past? How do I know what the low-hanging fruit is? Yeah, so we use a ladder hiring approach. So any new staff always come in at the bottom of the, the ladder mm -hmm. and then people learn as they go up. So no new staff member would learn the, the high-level stuff like the strategy. That's only for like... The, the top two sort of levels. Um, but we have old school SOPs. We just write all our SOPs out. It's an old school document. We can refer back. I, we just get, you know, if there's a new something that needs to be added to the SOP, we'll just get, you know, get the, the person writing the SOP to to chuck it in there, one one massive doc, and we can always refer back to it. There's tons of tools out there to do it all, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, you can't really go wrong with a, even if it's a thousand word doc, you know, you yeah, can yeah. always refer back to it and you've got all your table of contents on the side. It's always easy to, easy to flick through. Same with yeah. Google Docs these days and, and Google Drive and Dropbox. It's super, super easy yeah, to yeah. share it all. Um, how, how's, I want to get more into the tools in a second, but how's your role changed over the last two years? And it started this company oh, and mate, you've got 20 people. Insane. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Um, it's, it's, it's really good because um, I actually got off a call today with my accountability partner and we were reviewing all... He, he's looking at doing a big sale of his company that we started at the same time and we're going through all our goals and stuff like that. And I had to sit down and sort of like, 
I guess, be grateful right now for where I am in the company because it was where I wanted to be two years ago, man, because it, mm. it was me and an intern from Chennai, who's still who's still with the company, his, his role's totally changed too. But um, it was just me and him, just because when I when I left Lead Spring um, to focus on CRO, it was just me. I even left, you know, one of my team members that I had for five or six years with Lead Spring. He's doing really well now. Uh, you'll probably hear about him in the in your call with Matt. But yeah, it was we were just doing everything. So I was back to coding. I was back to setting up the A/B test. I was back to reporting. And then obviously when you start to grow and we started to get a big demand and we would hire someone new, hire someone new. And then I actually made the mistake. Well, not the mistake. You don't know at the time, but mm. of hiring a bunch of interns that weren't specialists in anything. So then, you know, everyone was learning everything medio mediocrely, you know, is that a word? Mediocrely? Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll make it a word. <laughs> learning everything. Everyone was learning everything okay. So then, you know, I had a consult from a guy called Mad Singers who's a, a business coach and he, he went through and looked at every like the way we need to restructure it. So we hired a bunch of specialists and that's when we, you know, that's when totally. we grew three, four, five times in that year. So totally. it, was, it was great. Yeah. Um, I'm totally just picking your brain here. How do you find good talent? Cause that's like, like I reckon that's the number one thing that will inhibit your growth is having good talent. Where do you, how do you recruit? What's your strategy for finding good talent and keeping them? It's, I, I still, I still do do a lot of it manually because I, I, I see it as like entering a relationship. I don't ever these days hire anyone. I never hire a VA. I never call a staff member a VA anymore. Mm. I just find it like super, not degrading, but it's sort of like trying to make them like they're not a real person. They're yeah. just virtual. I mean, so anyone that comes in has a, a specific role. Mm -hmm. So even today I did, I did, I think three calls with content writers because I want to make sure we're finding the right content writer. And out of that, we found an awesome an awesome lady that's an SEO site builder and she understands the technology. And it was great that, you know, I was able to get on a call with her and, and really build rapport and, and stuff like that. But for me, it's, I'm always looking for, it's slow for me. I don't have, you know, I, I've started this stuff doing, you know, the four hour work week, trying to SOP and automate everything. And I just found the, you end up putting more work in, you know, overall than if you just spend time at the start, really, trying to find those good um, those good operators, but making sure that they have the right intention because everyone's got different goals, you know. Mm. I've found that it hasn't been the best finding people in, say, Chiang Mai, where it's all digital nomads because they're not looking for a corporate long-term position. They're looking for, you know, something that they can go and live their lifestyle and travel around, which, you know, I've been there before, but it's yeah. not where I'm going to find a really loyal, dependent uh, part of the company that can grow with us, you know? Yeah, 100%. Uh, all right, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm thinking about the listener to this podcast now. They have a landing page. Most of our listeners are either freelancers or web agencies. They're doing SEO, they're doing web design, they're doing strategy consulting. They've got a landing page. They they look at Google Analytics every week and they go, wow, now I'm getting people visit the landing page, but no one's bloody signing up for a site audit or a consult call or whatever their call to action is. What's like the first couple of things they should be looking at and what's your preferred tool to help them quickly and easily manage an experiment? Yeah, so essentially the first the first step will be to look at the the high importance areas where you're gonna get the biggest wins most quickly using the Pareto principle. Like there's always 20% of the pages that are getting you towards 80% of your conversions, goals, sales, uh, affiliate commissions, whatever. There's all, it's always a case. It might be a few percentage off, but it's always around uh, 20%. Now, if it's an affiliate website, um, there'll be five pages generally that create most of the revenue on an affiliate site. If it's a, if it's a lead gen site, most of the time it's a, it's the homepage. Mm. Um, Cause you know, so, I'll, I'll focus on those two for now because there's a bunch of different monetization methods. So we'll look at, if it's an affiliate website, um, you said you work with affiliate websites, right? Or are there more web agencies? So more, web, more, more web agencies, yeah. Web agencies who are looking for so leads. I'll yeah, so I'll focus on that. So with, with lead gen sites, because we do work with a lot of lead gen sites, um, you gotta, you got to remove, the biggest thing we saw was removing forms from the website. So don't ask someone to fill out a form and don't ask someone for a quote or a a get them to apply. You want to give them something of value. You want to flip it around so that they want to 
give something of value to you, which is their email and their phone number. So you need to give something back to them. So generally what we'll do is, and I, I put up a great case study on our website of how we increased the Empire Flippers valuation tool by I think it was 50 odd percent in, in a month and a half. And what we did was we worked out all the questions that we needed from that from the user. So if it's a web firm, for instance, you might set up a question like a quiz and it might be like, um, what is, uh, you wouldn't ask what your budget is. That could be one of the, the questions, but it could be like, um, what are you looking for? And it could be SEO, website design or um, client sites. And that will be the first slide of the quiz. And when they choose one question, it goes to the next question and asks them, um, you know, what is your budget? Low, medium, high, whatever, something like that. But identify what the questions are that most of your like the most of the questions are that you need to pre pre-qualify the the clients mm -hmm. and then at the end give them a free report or give them a free audit or it's like it works really well for us as we give free cro audits um to people who apply on our website and it's a gamified form you'll see on our website it asks four questions what is your monthly traffic what is your monetization method and a couple of other questions um, and then we give them a free report but allows us to pre-screen people mm. um, to see if they're a good fit for us or if we can we give them you know we give them some quick wins on their website and then and then but it allows us to pre-qualify the, the the ideal clients and that's something with a with a web web design firm or something like that that would work really well is ask questions that you want to get out of them but don't make it seem like you're like asking them to to fill out a form yeah gotcha so and especially on mobile if, you, if you've ever tried to fill out a form on mobile it's atrocious to do so by having some nice big app style buttons mm. and you know like asking three or four questions um mm. and then at the end if they've if they've invested time to give you like three or four answered questions of you know like on the valuation tool on empire flippers it asks them you know what's their monthly traffic what's their monetization method and what, um, when are they looking to sell and how many hours they work a week? And then at the end, it's like, let us send you a free valuation and their algorithm spits out a valuation what the site's worth and that's the value they're giving back. But yeah. because we removed all those questions that were in a six form, a six field form and made it into like a nice app with icons and it was really intuitive, the conversions jumped instantly from that. So that's something for, for lead gen sites and I mean, there's a bunch of different tips for e-commerce, and but we've only, you know, we've only got half an hour, so yeah, I can't exactly. really go through that. But for, but yeah, for for a lead gen site, gamifying your forms will will be the single biggest, um, from our experience, the single biggest increase of conversions. Dude, that's have. that's epic. I'm totally stealing that. Um, we have a form, an application form that people fill in for our high end mastermind. I'm totally going to experiment and run a split test. Which yeah, make, check make, out the one on our homepage. Yeah, 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 we'll do. So the next question is: That would be, am I right in thinking? And I know this is getting into the details, but I think the details are important. Would that be a URL split test, or would that be an an, an element split test on the same URL? Yeah. So if it's a full redesign with a gamified form, generally you can do it. You can do it with um with an AB test. But yeah, split URL test is generally the way to go with. The way I like to say it is if it's a if it's a small on page change, yeah. it might be a headline and a call to action or something like that, um, or a, a comparison table or you know, a yeah. click the call button, something, yeah. then an A B test is fine. But if it's a full redesign and it needs to pull in separate parameters and it's dynamic and it's using different PHP to render it, then absolutely a a uh, split URL. And to make it safe for SEO, you just add in a canonical back to the original page. And it, it's safe for SEO oh, for people because that only comes up when you, say, when you say that. Yeah, don't ever use a no index tag. You can actually get your whole site uh, de indexed. Wow. That, so. Okay. All right. So on 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 B variation B, the canonical tag mm -hmm. it goes back to variation A That's as it. the right. Um, mm -hmm. And talk to me about VWO. Um, this is a very technical question, uh, so sorry to put you on the spot. But does if you run a if you run a because this is what these are the things that come up when you're running split test, right? These that you go you run an experiment and then you go holy shit, VWO is redirecting people to variant B, but for some reason it's stripping out the UTM parameters in the bloody URL. Now I'm probably using it wrong and I'm probably breaking it, which I'm known to do. Uh, one of the things I'm famous for. So um, how do you, I mean, is it possible to keep UTM parameters and campaign tracking intact when you're doing complete split tests on different URLs? As in, as in the UTM in the URL 
that's tracking it through analytics you mean yeah so generally but you can set up you can set up tracking through the conversion the through the um the actual cta too so you can actually do an on-page tracking instead we don't actually do any utm tracking through the url though at all okay like whatsoever so we do all the tracking through the actual elements on the page so a few reasons though in the in the in the vwo uh, raw data so you can pull a spreadsheet that shows where they're from uh, what device they were on their screen size huh. for all the conversions and then for the non-conversion so you don't just get did this convert better or not but you've got countries you've got you know, time of day, all this sort of data, which can only really be pulled through the 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 raw data reports, which are really actually quite hard to find when you don't know your way around VWO. So right. once we found once we found that, that just changed changed the whole changed the whole game. And then because you might you might run a split test and it it might it might show a loss, but it might show a loss on your variant B, but it might have actually won on mobile but decreased on desktop. Mm. And most split testing software does not show this. Yeah. Um, so we like a lot of times we'll run a separate split test to each, and that's how we'll increase our chances of winning split tests really significantly because almost always you'll get a win on either one. Yeah. Um, but then it's the other one that's gone down that's outweighed the the winner there. So little mm. things like that. Interesting. Um, um, uh, but yeah. If you're just starting out, would V like if I've never now I'm just thinking about the listener at home as well. I've never done split testing, but you've kind of got me excited about it. I want to start running my tests. What's the software that they should use? To, should they use something like a ClickFunnels or an Unbounce, or should they go all in on a an Optimizely or a VWO? Yeah. So so they're kind of different tools. So ClickFunnels and Unbounce are more landing page designers with split testing built in and don't get me if I'm wrong, but you guys have you guys have basic split testing built into into your platform too, right? Into uh, Elementor or not? Um, well, so Elementor, they actually have they. Uh, I don't think they have A/B testing. There is an A/B testing plugin you can use with Elementor. Ah, uh, right, right, yeah. Right, right. But work. This is the okay. The, yeah. So there's this is one of the problems with WordPress. Is it's it's very difficult to natively. Uh, do A/B testing in WordPress exactly. without using something like a Optimizely or a VWO? Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're different tools in the sense that one one's a page builder with split testing built in, yeah. and it's mainly for basic landing pages where it's like, hey, want to lose twenty pounds? Here's a free ebook. Enter your email. Like they're really good for basic landing pages and even some complicated ones. Don't get me wrong. I know a bunch of guys that are killing it with ClickFunnels. Yeah. Um, but VWO and Optimizely and and uh, what else we got Google Optimize, they're more for like heavy designs. If you're making sort of five to ten k minimum a month out of your website profit, then you might want to start looking at them. Where it's like a expensive, really detailed, encompassing, very like you can get a lot of info. They're very robust. Anything in between. Like, because I, I see like Unbounce and ClickFunnels is a good starting point. Mm. Um, anything in between, there are a bunch of new new ones out that I haven't actually personally tested because we've been in VWO now for two years, like yeah. Convert.com and um, I can't I can't even remember. I, I just did a I just did a blog post on a few others comparing comparing them at the moment. But there are a bunch of ones in the middle that are filling that market because. VWO and Optimizer used to have, you know, sixty dollar a month yeah, deals for did. ten thousand views, but they've completely wiped that now because yeah. they're focusing on guy. I don't even know how much we pay a year. It must be twenty, thirty grand a year for for yeah. our enterprise sort of package. Because why wouldn't they focus on on bigger that's, clients that's instead right. of having to manage thousands and thousands, right? So, yeah, I, I didn't even realize they'd they'd um shut those pricing and then you know we get people because all my all my content's based around vwo and then people can't get access to vwo now so sort of there's a bunch of you guys entering the market so so yeah like i said like if you don't i mean click funnels and unbounce a really great place to start and get your head around split testing and a b testing especially yeah Um, but then yeah as you get more into if you're thinking about starting a business as a cro person Mm -hmm. a specialist then you might want to start looking at 
some of the Optimizer or VWO I prefer over Google Optimizer. I'm really not a big fan of Google Optimize. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening to this podcast and you know of an AB or split test solution for that kind of mid-market, please feel free to come and leave us a comment on the blog post uh, and enlighten us. We were lucky enough we got grandfathered into a VWO plan about five years ago and we took it for a spin. So we're kind of just, we just sit in there and we don't really use it, but we're not going to cancel it because if we cancel it, we'll never get it again. Uh, so happy <laughs> we got that. Hey, um, Kurt, this has been awesome. This has been super helpful, uh, worth the price of admission alone, and that's not bad for a free podcast. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much for sharing some of your knowledge with us. Uh, where's the best place for people to reach out and connect with you online? Yeah, so our website is convertica.org um, and... Yeah, there's all the information on who we are. We give a free audit to to people who would submit through our form on the homepage, which is what I just talked about with that lead capture. We've gamified it. So especially if you're on mobile, it will seem like you're sort of in an app when you when you land there. But we also have um, a, a free Facebook group called the CRO Academy, which is where I share test results, I share good resources and I think we've got up, you know, over a thousand people in there now. Um, cool. Primarily discussing cool stuff they've found with CRO, fun like cool tests or resources that they've run themselves and stuff like that. So that's where I'll be. That's where I'm hanging out most of the time. Awesome. The CRO Academy is a Facebook group. I'm going to join that group and hang out in there as well. Uh, thanks for being a part mm-hmm. of the show. Really appreciate it, and look forward to seeing uh, how Convertica evolves over time. Awesome. Thanks, mate. That's how you uh, record an episode of the WP Elevation podcast, uh, my friends. Please subscribe on iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. It really does help us come up in the search results. WPElevation.com slash iTunes is where you can find that. And hang out with us on Facebook and YouTube at all the usual links there. I look forward to speaking with you again on the podcast very soon. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.